We're live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome once again to Civil War Seattle and our first Wednesdays with Savas Beatty authors series, although we're doing third Thursday this week. Uh, we had a little schedule blip, so we bumped people back. And tonight's guest, Neil Chatelaine, was kind enough uh, to reschedule to allow everybody uh, to work things out. So thanks, everybody, for dropping in here on a Thursday night. Uh, and welcome to Neil. Thanks for 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 joining us to talk about your book tonight. Absolutely, glad to be here. So I guess what, what I usually start with um, is uh, give you a chance to introduce yourself, uh, your background, um, and, and maybe after, you know, kind of tell us about, you know, education, anything like that, uh, move right into from there from how you were interested in the Civil War in general. Uh, touch on that because everybody likes to hear that story from authors and historians. How did you even get this bug to begin with? Uh, and then we'll pick up with, with your book after that. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, born and raised. I uh, grew up there and um, that has a big factor in the, me in the Civil War as well. Um, after I graduated from the University of New Orleans, I uh, joined the Navy, went to officer candidate school, was commissioned in the US Navy, became a Navy surface warfare officer, um, deployed kind of all over the world. I uh, spent nine years on active duty and in the reserves as a commissioned officer, and then um, transitioned over to the civilian side of things, uh, went back to grad school, got a couple of master's degrees in education and history and all that kind of stuff. And um, from there then started teaching. Uh, I teach now at Lone Star College in uh, the Houston area and at uh, Carl Winchie Career Academy in the Houston area that's on the north side of Houston. For anyone who knows anything about Houston. But uh, <laughs> um, as far as the Civil War bug, um, growing up in New Orleans, um, the Civil War is everywhere. There's mm -hmm. monuments, and there still are many monuments there. And um, growing up there with family who grew up there during the centennial, it uh, just became something that was talked about a lot and it was always mm -hmm. a topic of discussion. And at a very young age, I started taking interest in it, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. And as a mm -hmm. teenager, you know, started filling up bookshelves and bookshelves and then replacing those bookshelves when hurricanes destroyed them. And so it um, hooked. And a lot of it got me hooked because of the local side of things with mm -hmm. Louisiana, but also uh, just the emergence of new technologies to get people interested. You know, um, sure. video games about the Civil War as a kid growing up were interesting to me. And so that got me hooked on like orders of battle and things like that. So I just kind of mm -hmm. progressed from there on. So pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Did you, you know, your, your interest in going into the Navy coming out of college, did you have an interest in the Naval side of the Civil War early on? Or was that something that, that developed after your service? Uh, so it developed while I until through high school i was definitely an army bug kind of guy with um mm -hmm. studying the war you know i've got the books on gettysburg and the books on vicksburg and all the you know i was kind of your generic mostly eastern theater army reader at that point and um during college you know we were doing research projects and so on and mm -hmm. You know, we're taking, I'm taking a lot of classes at the University of New Orleans on the history of Louisiana, the history of New Orleans. And so when they make us write papers, I'm writing them about the Civil War. And so there's a lot more local things. And so it got me a little more um, interested in the New Orleans campaign of 62. And mm -hmm. um, the naval element started drifting off from there. And so I kind of got the naval bug while in college for studying the war. And it's kind of taken off since then. Mm -hmm. And so how did you come into the specific project, particularly with the, you know, these Mississippi River Valley naval operations and everything that surrounds that? Um, where recently or, or what point did this, were the seeds for this specific book planted? Like what, what did you feel there was a, a gap in the literature about it or were you uh, wanting to do more from something you had already already spent time with? Uh, so my first book, um, Fought Like Devils, was about, is about one ship in the Confederate Navy on the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. And that started out as a research paper for one of those classes. And after I finished that, uh, I kind of took a look around and I said, well, I've got a whole lot of other information here that's not just for this one ship that I couldn't fit into this book. And I looked around and saw that there was 
gaps in the literature on the Mississippi River. There's a heck of a lot on um, U.S. Navy forces on the river, uh, but mm-hmm. there was only like, one other book about the Confederate aspects of this, and uh, it was, you know, decades old at that point. And so I just sat down and started continuing to gather information, and it turned into something worthwhile. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's uh, it's commendable because it's definitely a, 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 a gap in the historiography, I think, that, that is worthy of attention because I think from a layman's perspective, as far as naval things are concerned, with the Confederacy, you think of, you know, privateers and blockade runners and one Confederate ironclad. And then that's kind of it, you know, that's, you don't, you don't get much more beyond that. So I think it's, it's underrepresented uh, it, the, it, to say the least. Uh, so this book is really a great, uh, hopefully starting point that maybe generations down the line, people will, you know, recognize this further and further. So this is a commendable project for sure. Uh, obscure, but, but, but not, I think obscure and maybe people's knowledge, but not obscure when it comes to the actual operations in the Civil War. So this is a really, really great project uh, to have completed this book. So now let's talk about what, since I said, you know, prior to, to you know, this book, I'm not familiar with the Confederate Navy was, what its uh, capabilities or its intentions or its ambitions or what. So uh, maybe paint that picture broadly as for what's going on What's the Confederate Navy even supposed to be? What do they think they want it to be? Um, cause I, and, and then we can, we can kind of move in from there if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when this, the Confederacy organizes, there is no Navy. They organize a Navy department. And then when there are so many Naval officers to see, joining the secession movement that the Confederate Navy Secretary, Stephen Mallory, is literally telling them to join the artillery of the Army because there are no ships. Um, now, they do get their hands on some ships, um, a few revenue cutters that are captured at the beginning of the war, a few other small um, harbor patrol crafts and such. Uh, but um, the Confederate Navy Secretary does envision early on that they need, they're never going to be able to build as many ships as the United States Navy. And so he very early on settles on the idea of the ironclad warships it, months before the U.S. Navy begins its blockade board and begins its ironclad boards. The Confederacy is looking at ironclad programs early on. And the idea is if they can get ironclads built fast enough, they can challenge naval supremacy of the United States when the U.S. Navy launches attacks, hopefully with wooden warships, and then they'll be able to defeat the U.S. Navy and break this blockade. And uh, they do this in a lot of different ways. They build ironclads at home. They try to build ironclads abroad overseas in Europe. Um, the commerce raiders that they send out to see, like the, uh, the, the raider Alabama, are part of mm-hmm. the deception part of, well, the blockade is going to be weakened if they send ships out onto the ocean to hunt these raiders. And mm-hmm. the U.S. economy will be weakened in the meantime as they capture ships too. So that's part of it. The privateers are part of that aspect as well. Um, but... Very early on, it's the Confederacy wants to build ironclad ships um, from the ground up, and then they want to augment those ironclad ships with wooden vessels that are um, acquired. They, the Confederacy builds very, very few wooden warships, and they're typically very small. Most of the ones they get are acquired, as in they just go to a merchant ship and say, we bought it, and literally just start adding cannons to it, and hopefully it doesn't fall apart sort of an idea. And in some cases, those ships work really well. In some cases, they're not seaworthy, they're not useful, and the ship doesn't protect the artillery and so on, so they're not very effective. Yeah. Um, from there, they build it up from there. So let's talk about the ship, I, I guess, their capacity or their shipbuilding industry in southern, southern port cities like New Orleans and, and others at that point compared to what's being produced in northern cities. Uh, you know, obviously, timber and lumber is going to be a concern, uh, for the South to produce versus versus what's available natural resource-wise in the North. But you talk about their desire for ironclads, and a lot of heavy iron is not something that the Confederacy was real good at producing through the war. Um, so how, how, how were they envisioning that production uh, up front versus how it plays out? So as far as infrastructure, there's a lot of different aspects of it, and it can get very technical just because there's so many moving parts on a ship that mm-hmm. it tends to be much more technically engineering uh, looked at than 
uh, you know, horses with carts in the on, in the field of battle kind of a thing. Uh, mm-hmm. As far as massive infrastructure, the Confederacy does possess shipyards upon the secession movement. Uh, they have um, seven, eight, nine, ten, about 11 shipyards in the Confederacy itself. Some of those are well known and big, like the Norfolk, the Gosport shipyard in Norfolk, where this Confederate ironclad Virginia is constructed and rebuilt upon the uh, Merrimack hole. Um, others are in like, there's one in Mobile, there's one in Pensacola, Florida. The Mississippi River, however, has seven major shipyards. And so the fact that they have so many shipyards, seven out of the 11 main shipyards that the Confederacy has means they can hmm. produce more ships there and construct more ships on the river itself, which hints at where more ironclads are going to be built and where they're going to try to hold positions a little bit more. Um Now, that being said, most of these shipyards are not building ships from scratch for the most part. Most of the shipyards, like in New Orleans, for example, had not built giant warships before. They just repaired them and then built smaller uh, river tugboats and so on. So it is a different type of um, construction and shipyard process. As far as as material goes, um, iron's always in short supply. Throughout the war, the Confederacy is going to cannibalize its own railroads to build ironclads and um, Hmm. they start by taking railroads that nobody is using because they're basically next to the united states military lines like near harpers ferry virginia and such Mm -hmm. and they'll melt them down in some cases and turn it into iron plating the confederacy can roll iron plating at um the tredegar iron works and at rolling mills in new orleans that then get moved to atlanta after that city gets captured by david farragut in other cases, they literally take railroad iron bars and nail them to the side of a ship, and hopefully they interlock enough so that cans can't get shells through the smaller gaps, sort of an idea. So sometimes it's very modern engineering where they can do that, and other times it's very much a hodgepodge on the scene. We've got nails and we've got railroad. Nail that railroad iron into that ship, and hopefully that works. Wow. And... and- was it? Do you think that's a source of innovation? Like historically speaking, some of these Confederate efforts and ideas that they were trying to come up with that uh, that maybe they couldn't execute, but they they had the mind power, but not maybe the, the actual resources. Do you, in your reading, have you found things like, wow, that was ahead of their time, or that was a really good idea at the time? So, um, as far as the infrastructure goes. The Confederacy is attempting to build warships pretty much however and wherever they can. Uh, the, the ironclad Albemarle was famously built in a cornfield in North Carolina. They were building an ironclad that was never finished in uh, on a bayou in Louisiana, literally on just an open grassy area next to the open bayou water. Um, so in some cases, they're in modern shipyards, and in some cases, they're literally going, there's a field let's gather all the local plantation infrastructure here. So we have some steam engines and some infrastructure and labor as the the enslaved labor as a source of labor as well. And then they try to make something work there and they just start building an ironclad on top of an existing wooden ship. Mm -hmm. Um, So they, from as far as the infrastructure, the innovation is more of a lack is more of a lack of issues. And so it's out of necessity Um, Mm -hmm. tactics wise. The Confederate Navy, especially in the Mississippi River Valley, is a place where a lot of significant um, innovation does happen. Um, The Confederacy invents commerce rating for the war in the city of New Orleans. The first privateers operate out of New Orleans. The first Army, Navy, Marine Corps Confederate joint operation starts out of New Orleans. the first successful use of torpedo warfare is the Confederate Navy on the Yazoo River, a tributary of the Mississippi. They experiment with submarines in New Orleans, and those move to Mobile and then to Charleston, and that becomes eventually the H.L. Hunley. Um, the first ironclad in North America is an ironclad that's constructed or converted off of a tug in New Orleans. Um, the first use of like ships ramming each other, that's, an, uh, that's a Mississippi River Confederate Navy operation that then the U.S. Navy will copy and so on and so forth. So tactics wise, there's a lot of innovation happening by the Confederate Navy in the Mississippi River that's copied by other Confederate naval forces elsewhere, but also by the United States Navy during the war as well. Wow. Wow. And what's the what's the I guess the quality of the 
of the leadership that's coming from the U.S. Navy that's that's upon secession moving into Confederate naval forces. These really pretty high high quality men from the U.S. Navy, so they're getting good leadership and good strategy and good resources that way to start with. So I will tell you that statistically, the Confederate Navy had a more professionally trained, commissioned officer corps than probably any of the other military organizations. And that's because so many Confederate U.S. Navy officers joined the uh, Confederacy. Now, that being said, it was very much a hit and miss situation of we're, some officers are old and were leftovers from the War of 1812. There are some Confederate naval officers literally born in 1799 um, and with 40 or 50 years of naval service. Others are very young. Um, there are some cases of officers who graduated in 1860 that are commanding ships because they were aggressive and they get lucky with cer certain attacks and that leads to some fortune there. Um, but it's very much that the Confederacy has trained officers. Now, the U.S. Naval Academy didn't exist until the 1840s. Um, mm -hmm. So senior officers on both sides are not trained by the Naval Academy. They were trained on ships themselves, and they served their teenage years on these ships, apprenticing, essentially, into the naval arts. But younger officers all have specialized training um, the commissioned officers do at least, and those are the, the commanders that are going to lead ships in battle for the most part. So there is a well-trained officer corps. Now, it's how effectively they're used, that's hit and miss, and how effectively they cooperate with the Confederate Army to bring about lasting efforts, that's also hit and miss. Um, yeah. But so I can actually give you a stat on this. The Confederate Navy had 527 commissioned or had 527 officers in total that survived the war, and 267 of those 527 um, were pr had prior U.S. Navy experience. So that's about 35 percent. As far as the commissioned line officers, the people who are actually commanding the ships, um, 164 of the 200 were prior U.S. military experience. So about 80%, about 78% had prior military experience with the U.S. Navy. So that's a huge percentage. There's no U.S. Army, field army, with where 80% of its senior officers, colonels and above, are had prior U.S. military experience. Like That's yeah. kind of an unheard of stat. And the Confederacy can do that because they have so few ships in operation that anyone who has prior experience gets command of a ship or is second in command of a ship or is instrumental in helping to make those happen. So the Confederacy uses its officers where they can, mm -hmm. some to great effect and some to not so good effect. I see. Well, let's skip ahead here uh, mm -hmm. on the slide to this first map. Uh, this is um, a pretty good map that we can get an overview of some of the operations. So we can kind of pivot into that. Um, I know some of the, you have some of the forts, Confederate forts uh, marked in red here. Uh, of course, the rivers are in blue. Uh, so if you need me to zoom in on any of this stuff as, as we go, um, I, I can just just point me in whatever direction you'd like in that, in that way. But uh, so with that, I guess, We've got officers. We've got some ships. Everything's kind of shaping up that they're they're maybe going to execute on what they had for for an intention with how to hold these waterways, the arteries of the rebellion. Uh, so what happens? <laughs> Let's begin in 1861 and look at this map and 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 do your best to just just give us a broad overview of how things work and don't work. Uh, so 1861 is very much the year where very little happens for both sides on the Mississippi River's waterways. Now, there are significant naval actions that do occur. Um, the Confederacy is launching commerce raiders and privateers out of New Orleans at the river's mouth. Um, there is a Confederate warship accompanying Leonidas Polk when he moves into Kentucky. There's a Confederate warship covering Columbus, Kentucky uh, at the very top of the map there as Polk is fortifying Columbus, Kentucky. Uh, Confederate ships are at the same place when the Battle of Belmont happens. They're ferrying reinforcements from Columbus to Belmont to stop Ulysses Grant's attack there. 
Uh, the Confederacy uses its first ironclad ever to try to open the blockade of the, at the mouth of the Mississippi River in 1861 in October. Um, they embarrass the U.S. Navy blockading forces, but don't break the blockade. They just kind of dent it for about 24 hours. Um, so there is activity happening at the upper part of the river and the lower part of the river. But for the most part, 1861 is a year where they're building ships, acquiring ships, and converting civilian ships. And this is both sides. So the Confederacy is building two massive ironclads in New Orleans and two more ironclads in Memphis, another ironclad um, in Tennessee near Nashville. Uh, that's never going to get finished for the Confederacy. The U.S. Navy will capture that one and put it into U.S. Navy service. But they're mostly trying to build these ironclads and then acquire wooden ships to augment them. While at the same time, the U.S. Navy is building the city class ironclads that are going to come downriver um, and help to uh, support Ulysses Grant's armies at Vicksburg eventually. And I got one, one quick question, if I can interject. We've talked a lot about building the ironclads and with that time frame, uh, how how long does it take them to, to say if they have a, a structure of a ship that they're starting with, not building from scratch, but how long does it typically take them to construct an ironclad so it's functional the way they want it to be? Uh, so the first Confederate ironclad was um, a tugboat that they cut the top off and then rolled some iron plating over it into like a little eggshell sort of a shape. And that was called the Manassas. And it was built in about two or three months. The conversion process took about two or three months. Um, there are cases uh, that's the Manassas ramming Picture. in the middle there, and we've got another one of Manassas as well. It's the eggshell one that's kind of at the end, I think. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Here we go. That's the one. Yeah. So um, th this one it takes a couple of months for them to do the conversion for. Um, but it's not very heavily armored or armed. It's only got about an inch of iron plating and one cannon and a ram. Whereas, you know, the big ironclad Virginia has many more artillery pieces and the art and the armor is much thicker, many different layers of armor. Um, other ships that are part of the, co that get converted from existing ships like Virginia take many more months to complete just because of extenuating circumstances or supply issues. Building an ironclad from scratch can take up to a year or more, um, depending on the situation. So, so that even just just standing up this fleet takes it out of action in 1861, really, because it's yes, you know, getting muskets in hands for infantry, uh, you know, that can happen much much faster, uh, it would seem, than than getting these naval things operational. And this is an issue both sides are facing in 1861. Mm -hmm. the, the, the U.S. Navy's ironclads that come down the river, the city-class ironclads, um, they take several months to get built as well. It's not mm -hmm. just a, the U.S. has more infrastructure, so the ships are built overnight. That's not how it works at all. There's too many moving parts on a ship. Mm -hmm. And there are too many ships being built where to, to just focus on one at a time. And so, um, yeah, it's a very months-long process. The Confederacy's ironclads at new orleans get contracted for in september 1861 they're still not ready in april of 1862. Mm. so if when things start to to you know go into <clears throat> uh service for both sides late or early 1862 then things are starting to happen operations wise right so why don't we uh kind of how, how do how do we get through that from you know mid eighteen sixty two up until eighteen sixty three in Vicksburg with where operations are happening how they're uh, being administered basically by the military between these joint forces and that kind of stuff I know that's a something that you cover a lot in your book is just that that the difficulty in the different organizations and all that um, so so introduce us to to the complexity of eighteen sixty two and and in on these rivers with Confederate uh, naval and, and, and land-based operations as well. Uh, so 1862 is the year everything happens for the Navy, for both sides on the Mississippi River itself. Um, that's the year the Confederacy is trying to gain parity with the U.S. Navy with these ironclads they're building. They propose to have many ironclads, about 10 in operation by the end of 1862, 
only about three of them get finished completely, but they're trying to gain the same number of ships as the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy can build them faster, which does play a factor. And so when the campaigns begin in 1862, the U.S. Navy has more ships ready to go. And so when the Confederacy gets at a disadvantage, they can't really recover from that. And that's kind of the root cause of why the Confederate Navy fails um, as far as number of ships wise. Another main factor is organization. The Confederate Navy was not just the Confederate Navy. There were many organizations operating vessels on the Mississippi River for the Confederacy. There was the Confederate Navy and its Marine Corps, which is what you would think would be operating all these ships. There was the Confederacy's Revenue Service, which is the equivalent of the U.S. Revenue Marine, which is the precursor to the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, there's the Confederate Army operating warships as well, uh, typically lighter warships with field artillery on top of the decks instead of actual naval guns. Um, there are privateers that are privately owned. Louisiana has its own navy of a couple of ships. There are civilian ships that are contracted to the government for the navy or the army that answer to different people. Blockade runners are civilians answering to no one, but still bringing in supplies. And then there's this group called the River Defense Fleet, which is part of the Confederate Army, but not. They answer to the Secretary of War, and they're civilian contractors that run some ships, and they don't really take orders from anybody, and they kind of do their own thing. And sometimes they work really well, and sometimes they don't. So the, the point is, it's not just the Confederate Navy. It's a whole slew of Confederate naval forces, mm -hmm. and cooperation is a real factor. I mean, there are stories where sailors that each organization offered different pay and so sailors would join the confederate navy and when the river defense fleet they would advertise getting paid three dollars more a month they would desert the confederate navy and just go to the other organization and the other organization would not report them for desertion because they were taking the manpower too so it's not just cooperation of the enemy ships are right there we need to cooperate right now for that it's also who actually has responsibility for that cannon that's sitting right there? Which ship is it actually going to go on? Um, where's the gunpowder coming from and who has jurisdiction over the logistics? And that's a really big factor where in some cases it works well and in some cases it doesn't. Now, as far as um, the campaigns of 1862, it almost sounds like the naval campaigns of 1862 echo the continuous operations of 1864 that people are used to, like the Overland Campaign, because mm -hmm. in 1862, there are basically continuous naval operations. February 1862, the U.S. Navy is helping to capture Fort Henry and Donaldson um, to get to in the inland part of Tennessee. After they capture that, uh, the Confederacy retreats from Columbus, Kentucky, down to um, Island Number 10, which is on the uh, top of the map there. And there's a siege of Island Number 10 by U.S. Army and Naval Forces, and the Confederate Army is there, and the Confederate Navy is supporting them there, to the point where March and April is a continuous everyday series of attacks and counterattacks. When the Confederacy loses Island Number 10, their ships retreat to Fort Pillow right there, which is the site of that 1864 massacre of African-American soldiers. At this point, it's still in Confederate hands, and the Confederate naval forces launch a counterattack there and sink a couple of U.S. Navy ironclads. They don't control the water space after the battle, so the U.S. Navy will re-raise those ironclads and put them back into service. But we have Confederate ships sinking U.S. ironclad warships. They aren't as impregnable as people think. And that's May 1862, so February, March, April, May. And then in June 1862, after... Um, Henry Halleck captures Corinth, Mississippi. Memphis is outflanked. Fort Pillow gets evacuated. And um, the Confederate naval forces on the upper part of the river are destroyed at the Battle of Memphis. And that's in June 1862. So a continuous series of operations every day from February to June, kind of echoing that Overland campaign to an extent. Further south in 1862 at the same time, David Farragut is capturing New Orleans in April and then Baton Rouge, Louisiana in April, and then moving upriver to Vicksburg. Both naval forces, the ones coming from upriver, the ones coming from downriver, meet at Vicksburg in the summer of 1862, and around June 1862. And then the Confederacy launches another big counterattack when 
um, their ironclad Arkansas being built at around Yazoo City, Mississippi, but basically being built in the middle of a flooded part of the river where they had to bring barges out to the ship because they didn't have the infrastructure to get it to a certain dockyard. Um, that ship counterattacks and kind of saves Vicksburg for a year by stalling U.S. efforts to attack Vicksburg directly until the Mississippi River's water levels drop because of the uh, spring thaws are over and the summer is when the water drops the most in the river um, to get towards winter. And so the, the U.S. Navy has to abandon their efforts to capture Vicksburg for a year, basically, because of that. And that's when Ulysses Grant starts trying all of his many efforts to capture it by ground, Chickasaw Bayou and the Bayou Steel Expedition and all these other uh, mm -hmm. efforts, which are both Army and Navy operated. So while Grant is investing Vicksburg, the Confederacy is trying to rebuild a fleet of three ironclads at Yazoo City. They build a, a, a modern Navy yard at Yazoo City, and they're using ships that survived all these battles in 1862 in 1863 to supply John Pemberton's army at Vicksburg to defend Yazoo River until um, those ironclads could be made ready. And in fact, when Ulysses Grant is besieging Vicksburg, um, David Dixon Porter, the U.S. Navy Admiral in command of the river forces there, sends a large chunk of his squadron up Yazoo to y the Yazoo River to capture Yazoo City, Mississippi, destroy those ironclads before they can be finished because he was worried that if Arkansas could stop the entire fleet, what are three of them going to do at the same time a year later? And um, so there are some significant worries by the U.S. Navy there because when the Confederacy can get ships going, they can win some pretty spectacular localized tactical victories. And so the U.S. Navy is always kind of worried that uh, that will expand. Uh, but the last Confederate ships on the Yazoo River don't get destroyed or captured until almost a month after Vicksburg surrenders, because those that ships then mm. would support Joseph Johnston's relief effort at Jackson, Mississippi, that then stalls the continued push of Grant elsewhere. Um, and so ships are all part of this. Now, there aren't very many naval battles at Vicksburg in 1863, but there are a lot of support efforts. The Confederates will sink a ship in the river to block a spot so the U.S. Navy can't get past a fort right there. Um, that's in the case of Fort Pemberton at Greenwood, Mississippi. That's the top of the zoomed in part of the map right there. Um, in other cases, they're using the ships to transport supplies or to um, relocate soldiers or to even just transport food from one place to another. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a significant use of naval forces to provide infrastructure and support for the Vicksburg area. Even after Vicksburg falls and the Confederates are trying to regroup, they're using those ships to the last minute. Sort of an idea. Yeah. So given given the outcome, given what we you talked about with the initial infrastructure concerns and command concerns and stuff, what's your overview of how it performed? I mean, that 1862 was just the time that they probably had their most capability and their most potential to, to affect outcome in that theater of war. Do you think they did the best they could do or there were certain things that just really undercut what they could have done differently or or that would have changed any major outcome? Uh, yeah, it's it, the big issue with eight, with the Confederacy with 1862 is leadership is not all speaking the same language. Um, so I mentioned all these different organizations. Well, the Confederacy didn't take the idea of, well, let's send all the river defense fleet upriver and all the Confederate Navy is gonna defend the downriver part so it's unity of command in each area. They would send half the river defense fleet upriver, half of it downriver. There's one Confederate Navy commander for the entire river, um, but he can only be in one place at a time. And he has a tendency to make other people angry sometimes. And so like, um, it's just a matter of, they don't properly allocate command and control and a lot of times commanders can't put egos aside when the enemy is literally staring at them and they still refuse to cooperate with each other. And I'm not saying that that's the case universally. There are some cases where some spectacular cooperation occurred on Lake Pontchartrain, just north of New Orleans, the Confederate Army loaned soldiers to the Confederate Navy, loaned cannon to the Confederate Navy, and the Confederate ships were able to do a lot to support New Orleans from an indirect way. Um, on Bayou Teche, which is in southern Louisiana, um, south of that Vermilionville part on the map. Um, the Confederate ships there are 
a lot of times civilian owned ships impressed by the Confederate army, manned by soldiers with a civilian captain, with a Confederate Navy officer advising and training. And they cooperate and actually defeat the U.S. Navy in a couple of smaller skirmishes, capture some ships and expand the some local control in some areas for a certain amount of time. So there are some spectacular areas of cooperation, but there are some spectacular failures of cooperation as well. And to me, um, you know, you can't play a what if game of inventing time to get ironclads mm-hmm. ready that weren't going to be ready. You know, yeah. you can deal with that a little bit with um, allocation of supplies a little bit better, but um if the Confederacy wanted to really maintain control of the river in a more substantial way, uh, a better unity of command and a better cooperation between army and naval forces would have worked. And the Confederacy learns that lesson. Um, Beauregard and um, Captain John Tucker, the naval commander at Charleston in 1863, cooperate spectacularly. And the U.S. military gets nowhere in Charleston in 1863, for example. Um, so there are lessons learned from this, but losing the entire Mississippi River and being forced to rely on just the tributary and distributary inland waters is a huge lesson to have to learn at that cost. That's a huge cost for that sort of an idea to take shape. So um, uh-huh. I would say command and control is the biggest challenge for them. I see. Okay. Yeah. Well, so that's a great segue for what happens after the fall of Vicksburg and after the command of the Mississippi is unified under U.S. Navy control, U.S. military control, I should say, not just naval. Uh, And then what remains of these forces do go into, you said, the tributary and distributary water, inland waterways. Uh, How, what's happening there? I mean, they're not just going up there to hide. They're still actively engaged throughout the rest of the war. Um, so, so tell us, tell us about that. How, how um, those forces are, what what they do, and and uh, really, what again, maybe maybe that consideration of what was expected versus what happened. I think that was a, maybe a good way. So, after the river, the Mississippi River itself is lost to the Confederacy, they reconstitute localized fleets in a lot of other places. Shreveport, Louisiana, they build an ironclad and support it with a couple of wooden vessels. Um, the Bayou Tesh and Atchafalaya area um, of southern Louisiana. They're building another ironclad there that doesn't get finished and augmenting it with captured ships from the U.S. Navy, a couple of them, and also several wooden ships that survived the loss of New Orleans. Um, Yazoo City, they try to reconstitute a naval force there. And so the Confederacy recognizes that they can still do something with naval forces. Um, the difference is that they're not going to make all these fleets, these smaller localized fleets, and mm-hmm. recapture the Mississippi River and defeat 50 U.S. warships in a, a giant battle. What they're doing is they're building these fleets, these smaller localized miniature squadrons to maintain control of those inland waterways. They're mm-hmm. building an ironclad at Shreveport so they can maintain control of the Red River. They're building ironclads at Yazoo City so that they can threaten Vicksburg to hopefully stall it for another year. They're building iron ships at on the Bayou Tesh and on Atchafalaya River to maintain control of southern Louisiana, not to push outward, but to block enemy advances at that point. And in, in a lot of cases, they block them well, um, at least for a few months at a time until the U.S. Navy can concentrate more ships into that area. Um, but it is definitely still an active thing. So, um, 1863, the Confederate Navy does get swept out of Atchafalaya River and Bayou Tesh in southern Louisiana. 1863, you know, they capture Vicksburg and the Yazoo River. 1863, the U.S. Navy, the same squadron attacking Vicksburg, goes up the Red River and gets stopped by the Confederacy's ground forces and um, naval forces, which are not the Navy. It's basically the Confederate Army with a couple of ships that they captured from the forts that disabled some enemy ships. And then they load a bunch of soldiers on them, smash the ship into more ships, disable those union ships. And then they throw all the soldiers on and charge basically in a ship to ship battle, hmm. kind of like ancient Roman times almost. And that works for a while. 1864, the Confederacy um, has another threat on the red river when the U S Navy's red river campaign with Nathaniel Banks's army and David Porter's squadron of ships goes up the Red River to capture Shreveport to threaten Texas. And the Confederacy has a lot of good cooperation there. They've got um, Richard Taylor and and Kirby Smith fighting the ground part. 
Um, Confederate engineers are actually building dams to divert the Red River's water into other areas to lower the water level of the Red River. Hmm. And the Confederate Navy has torpedoes everywhere, underwater mines, and they have their ironclad there with wooden ships to support um, in case the U.S. Navy gets past all that. So there is some actual defense in depth going on. Now, that being said, that saves the Red River for the Confederacy for the rest of the war. In other areas where the Confederacy doesn't have ships, it's the Confederate cavalry that's actually doing the most against the U.S. Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, some places like Yazoo City, Mississippi, or Johnsonville, Tennessee, or some places um, like Clarendon, Arkansas, it's literally the Confederate cavalry rides up to the riverbank, sees a U.S. Navy ship or a supply steamer, rolls out some horse artillery, gets a lucky shot to disable an engine, and then the cavalry basically tries to get the ship to smash into the riverbank because it's disabled, and they bum rush it with, with horse soldiers to try to get them to surrender. Uh, the biggest case of this happening is Nathan, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest's entire cavalry corps in 1864 – in support of John Bell Hood going to Nashville, does this about half a dozen times uh, near Johnsonville, Tennessee. They disable one ship with horse artillery, load the horse artillery onto that ship, use that ship to disable a couple of more, and they just keep repeating that. And then they launch a naval assault with cavalry soldiers on Johnsonville, Tennessee, which is the main U.S. Army supply depot in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. uh, all of now George Thomas's army in Nashville has no supplies, so he will retreat into Kentucky. Uh, that doesn't work. It's a huge success story in depriving the U.S. from supplies with cavalry on ships. It makes for a great story, uh, but then the cavalry can't capitalize on it, and the U.S. can counter-respond and send supplies, so it doesn't alter that campaign in the end. But um, yeah. so At the end of the war, there's some crazy stories like that of people disabling one ship at a time in some of these – hilarious stories uh, but they don't change the factor of the war you know cavalry taking one ship is not going to change who controls that waterway mm -hmm. it's going to make some headlines for the newspapers essentially and give some pride to some soldiers uh, so in some cases again the um the joint army naval cooperation works really well and in some cases it, it doesn't work very well at all and in other cases it works but not in a way that can be capitalized on sure so control of these these tributary rivers at this point in the war, um, you know, obviously they're they're controlling troop movements and ship movements, uh, but how is this losing control of those type of waterways impact the Confederates Confederacy's ability to feed itself and to get you know get foodstuffs to the armies and that sort of stuff? Is this are they are these waterways being used that way as well for you know as uh, this, the way railroads are in North Carolina and Virginia to feed the armies at that point? Does that factor into this as yeah. well? Yeah. So if you look at the map, even just where it is zoomed in, there's so much blue there to represent all these internal waterways. And it's not that the Confederacy didn't have ships. They had ships and they had civilian ships that operated as well. Uh, so transportation of supplies is a major factor and even controlling a hundred mile stretch of some of these waterways allows for significant movement of foodstuffs or other yeah. supplies. I mean, the Confederacy's one of its only salt works is in Southern Louisiana and they're using um, ships to get them from there to other parts of the Confederacy um, through other inland routes as well. Um, but so it's definitely not just we're using the ships to, cross the Mississippi river with food to get to the food to Vicksburg. And that definitely happened in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, there are some cases of the U S Navy specifically targeting just the supply ships and sending their ships out on a whim that where some of them eventually get destroyed or captured just to try and destroy some of these Confederate supply ships. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, after the Confederacy loses control of the Mississippi river, there are even some cases of the Confederate army swimming cows across the river on barges or just swimming them and like, okay, half of them die in the attempt. So what, but they got to get food from Texas and Louisiana to the other side. And they're like, Oh, you know, it's almost comical where you can go, okay, we looked and there's no U S ships for 10 miles in either direction. We have one hour to get these cows across the river. Let's go. 
You know, it's wow. it's 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 crazy that the 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 efforts they were forced to rely upon because they had less infrastructure. Um, yeah. Places where they controlled inland waters, they used those inland waters as those transportation networks. Yeah. Okay. Great effect. Um, yeah. As long as they could cooperate on what was going to be transported at that given time. Yeah. So uh, we're getting on about 45 minutes here. So I do want to encourage uh, you guys that are watching, if you have questions, throw them in the comments now. So we have a couple, a few minutes here to get them uh, to Neil to answer. Um, and, and we have just, and this seems like we've talked about a lot, but I think we've barely turned the first page on what's uh, what Neil has in this book and in his research and everything. Uh, so I will take this moment before we do get into questions to encourage all of you guys to get the book. Uh, it's it's you know support Savas Beatty, Savas Beatty authors, best maps in the business, Savas Beatty. So uh, so it's it's a complicated topic, but with good maps, it makes sense and good illustrations and, and things. And we had a whole queue of portraits and pictures of ships and stuff. We were hoping to get maybe to, but we didn't really. So I want to ask, this is me being a little selfish here with our last couple minutes, uh, waiting for, for people to throw some questions in here is you mentioned the use of torpedoes. Uh, that's something that I came across a little bit in my research involving some civil war veterans here in Seattle who were, victims or survivors of uh the i for, we looked up the name of the ship and i can't remember now, commodore jones in the yeah. james river in 1864 uh and reading about that made me intensely curious about these these things in the image here which are the assortment of mines and torpedoes and things i know a little bit about how they operated you know in the james with you know and the, the chains that they strung across the river that sort of that sort of you know I guess you would say land-based deterrent, ship deterrent sort of activity. But I know nothing of how that would have played out on these rivers, smaller rivers in, in that theater and what their capabilities were. And just, I mean, it's just cool stuff. So maybe you can tell us about what these were and how they were employed, how they were constructed in, in these different rivers, Mississippi or the tributaries uh, for a couple minutes. Uh, and then we'll take any questions that we get here at the end. Absolutely. Uh, so torpedoes in the Civil War sense are underwater sea mines of today's vocabulary and vernacular. So uh, if we're talking about torpedoes of the Civil War, we're talking about mines today. Um, the Confederacy does use underwater mines, these torpedoes, to great effect. In fact, um, the list, the counting tally is that about 40 U.S. warships and support vessels were destroyed by Confederate underwater torpedoes in different factions over the course of the war, um, including numerous U.S. ironclads. Now, um, there are many different types, as you can see from the, the graphic right there. Some of these are contact torpedoes where an enemy ship has to smash into it, and then that sets off pressure changes that de detonate the charge. Others are um, detonated by a guy with a wire almost in like a wily e. coyote yeah, the, the, the plunger hiding in the woods sort of an idea where they're like okay they're over the spot where we think that the thing is and then they like literally blow it up like that and sometimes they hit and sometimes they don't um but the confederacy uses these underwater torpedoes to great effect especially in the mississippi river valley um mm -hmm. they're all across the entire length there are many reports of u.s navy officers hearing them bouncing off of their hull, but the ships are old, but the torpedoes have been in the water current for too long and they don't detonate. Um, similar to what happened at Mobile Bay with a couple of instances with David Farragut. Um, the first underwater torpedo to sink an enemy ship is on the Yazoo River. And that's the uh, sinking of the USS Cairo, which you can go visit in Vicksburg, Mississippi now. They've uh, since raised it up or what's left of it they've raised up. Another U.S. ironclad of the same city class ironclads was sunk on the Yaz River a year, a few months later, by the USS Baron de Calg, same situation almost, in almost the exact same spot. So they would use these torpedoes to great effect. David Dixon Porter, in going up the Red River in 1864, said he was more worried about the Confederate torpedoes in the river because they were expected to have so many of them than he was about actually defeating the Confederate warships, just because torpedoes forces his ships to stop, take their time, clear the area, and that leaves them open to counterattack. So mm. they're used to great effect. It's a very low cost, 
And if they don't work, so what? But if they do work, you can cause some serious damage and freak the enemy out a lot by these sudden attacks that cause damage that nobody sees coming, essentially. Well, so my final thing to ask you about is the actual research for this book, because uh, some of these topics are obscure. And of course, you know, there's the companion record to the official records of War Rebellion, and the, the naval uh, set of records that way. But what you had to do, I'm sure, goes far beyond that kind of stuff to find find these sources and that you can't follow a roadmap through the bibliographies of other authors' research that you like, that sort of stuff. So how did you... Just, just briefly, I guess. How did you go through the process of accumulating your research for this? It's, it's uncharted territory in a lot of ways to me. So, um, when the Confederacy evacuated Richmond, Virginia, the naval records were destroyed. They were not taken out by train. Most of them ended up burned when the city burned during the evacuation process. And so, the records that the Confederacy has in the official naval records, the ORN books. Mm -hmm. um, those are mostly records that individual officers kept their reports of and mailed to the U.S. government. It's not that they oh, have okay. a cache of these. And so very much what you'll see in the, if you actually look at the official naval records is one volume will be, you know, 800 pages, just like all the other Army volumes are. But mm -hmm. 650 to 700 pages of that will be U.S. Navy records and about 100 to maybe 200 at the most are Confederate Navy records. And so – the paperwork trail is just completely different for starting things out. And typically surviving reports are from ship captains, not from junior officers who are giving affidavits about things like you'll see with the U S Navy counterparts. Uh -huh. um, the national archives does have a lot of Confederate Navy records um, <clears throat> accumulated. Uh, very little of it is digitized at this point. And so trips <laughs> to places where those exist are still required for the most part. Um, but they do exist to an extent. And um, and that's mostly because of getting the National Archives to collect records from the individual port cities that weren't destroyed. You know, Charleston was captured at the end of the war, but not burned. New Orleans was captured, but not destroyed or shelled. Mm -hmm. And so some records were left behind in these evacuations. And so those ended up in the National Archives as well um, to an extent. Uh, besides that, there's a lot of memoirs from Confederate naval officers and picking those apart minutely to figure out who actually did what correctly can be tough, mm -hmm. um, but it does exist. A lot of newspaper work, um, the Confederacy loves mm -hmm. things in their newspapers, and that's not so much for getting like super specifics, but the Confederacy, just like any other group, if a ship docked in Memphis the Memphis newspaper wrote the next day that that ship docked there. And so sometimes you can actually track the movement of ships, not specifics about who was on them or anything like that, but you can track movements to an extent, um, to a certain degree. And so it's really a lot of puzzle pieces of hints of information at different places that then you can slowly form a picture of. It's almost like a uh, military intelligence work today. If you get hints and shadows of things and, over the course of a year, you might be able to put enough shadows together to get a working picture of what happened to an extent. Yeah. Uh, well, here's a, one question we got from my friend, Matt McCauley, who lives here in the Seattle area. Um, this is something I don't know about. And it's come up on a couple different tours uh, of mine because he's, this is a Confederate Naval figure who's buried here in, well, he's not buried here, but he has a marker here in Seattle's most historic cemetery. His name is Jefferson Davis Howell. He was Jefferson Davis's brother-in-law, you know, Sir uh, Verena's brother. Uh, and he, in his, I, I don't even know which ship it was that he was on in the Pacific that was creating a little bit of panic on the North Pacific coast at that time, uh, that he died in 1875 uh, on, it's according to Matt here on a ship in the Pacific. He was lost at sea, but they did put the obelisk in the cemetery for him. Um, and he's asking just if, if, if you know if his Confederate naval service was noteworthy for the time, for what he did in the Pacific, if that's something you're familiar with. Um, so uh, Jefferson Davis Howell was technically not a member of the Confederate Navy. Um, he was part of some of those auxiliary organizations. Um, 
after the war, he went to Europe for a little while and okay. um, worked on merchant ships there. And then he relocated to the West Coast, uh, where he worked on the Pacific Mail Steamship Company, um, going the routes between Seattle, San Francisco, Panama, and so on. Yeah, um, yeah. Which is kind of ironic because a lot of Confederate naval officers end up working for the Pacific Mail Steamship Company on the West Coast after the war. Oh, Even wow. though were some of the very ships that they were trying to capture during the war. It's kind of an interesting side huh. there. Um, but yes, Jefferson Davis Howell was a, on the West Coast. He was a Confederate uh, naval veteran to an extent. And uh, he did operate as a ship commander on the West Coast. And I do believe he did die when his ship was sunk, as, when his Pacific Mail Steamship Company vessel was sunk um, 1870s, I think. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, Matt said 1875. Uh, it was from going, it was traveling from San Francisco to Victoria, BC, uh, and it had a collision actually off Cape Flattery, which is out off the uh, Pacific coast here. Now, there is another Confederate naval officer with some Seattle ties. Um, a, oh. a Lieutenant William R. Dalton was in the Confederate Navy. Oh, Robert Robert Inch Dalton, yes, William Robert Inch Dalton. And so he was. I think he became a doctor after the war, and then he died in Seattle. I don't know if he's buried there or not, but I, I know he died there, I think. He is. So he, as I understand, during the war, he was, uh, the the ship that he was on was basically on a diplomatic mission between France and England and the Confederacy. And he was young. He was 16 or something like that, I think. After the war, he went to New York and was at uh, NYU and became a pretty renowned dermatologist. And then he wound up here with his practice in Seattle. Uh, he was a really key figure late uh, in the 1920s uh, for reconciliation between Union and Confederate veterans. He was very much late in life, kind of a, I guess you would say, poster child, really, for the reconstructed Confederate. A lot of our Confederates here were. Um, but yeah, he's, you know, they always talk about his, his naval service. And he served in the Navy, but also in Virginia too. I think he was a running mess. Everybody was a messenger for Stonewall Jackson. You. So he did something like that. He, you know, he was a, you know, messenger boy for Lee or Jackson, whatever it was. We just put 20 guys that had that job here. Um, but he is buried in the Confederate burial plot in Lakeview Cemetery in Seattle, which is the only dedicated Confederate burial plot west of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, so they do have that, that one uh, naval connection through, mm -hmm. through him. So there's, yeah, I, I had kind of forgotten about that. So yeah, I guess we do have more Confederate Navy here than I had given credit to in our pre our pre interview chat there. Well, I've, I've, been to, I've been trying to track down post war things of Confederate naval officers. Just so few, you can we can get a better picture of post war life and statistics because there are fewer of them. We can get a more complete image of it. And yeah, that I've been trying to get, track down certain things from and in my statistics of who moved west, who moved here, who moved. So yeah, well, I've got lots on him. We've got pictures and photos, and I can I know where his house was, and go. I can well, I'll send you. I'll send you. You can do whatever you want with it, but I got tons. So so I'll send some stuff your way on that. So it looks like that's it for questions, and we've been on here about an hour, and we've had uh, a nice number of people watching tonight. That's great. Uh, this is a, a a captivating topic, and I I have learned as much as as anybody watching tonight because. Uh, I admittedly didn't know a whole lot about this coming in. So I'm really thankful uh, for you for joining us tonight. And you guys, uh, Savas Beatty, let me pull it up here real quick at the end. Uh, they did give us a code. You can put virtual if you want to buy his book uh, from Savas Beatty direct and not through uh, Amazon or used or anything like that. You can go to SavasBeatty.com, enter this code, get a discount. Uh, and really dig into this topic because it's fun stuff. It's something different. If you were tired of hearing about Gettysburg uh, or Lookout Mountain or something, this this is a pretty fun read. Uh, so I'd recommend everybody to, to check that out. Um, so do you have anything uh, you want to throw in here at the end, a website for your for your your work as a historian or anything that you want to yes, promote? Here or um, so first I'll say that um, the, the book is available in paperback now. That came out uh, just a couple months ago. So they're, they're fresh out of the hardback, basically. You can get some of those hardcovers on Amazon, but I think Savas Beatty's website itself is fresh out of the, um, the paperbacks themselves, or the hardcovers, and you can only get the paperbacks. But that okay. being said, paperbacks cost less money, so you're even getting a better deal on that anyway. Um, if you're interested in more 
Uh, on my end, uh, I write for the Emerging Civil War blog and everything for them. And uh, I have a website, neilpchatelaine.com, which is just my name. And you can Google my name and misspell it, and it's perfectly fine. It will come up today. <laughs> um, and that's okay. But um, it has links to a bunch of the articles that I've written. So if um, this has piqued your interest and you want to see some more Navy stuff, um, you can check out my website. And there's links to all my blog postings and all of uh, the magazine articles and things that I've written. So um, you can get a better feel for just exactly what's out there for the historiography of some of that stuff. Yeah. yeah. One other question. This one was not from tonight, but somebody asked me when I was uh, sharing the upcoming event earlier this week. They were curious, and I couldn't tell which of which is the ironclad here in the front in this image. So that's the uh, Confederate ironclad Arkansas. It is, okay. Smashing past the um, U.S forces in July of 1862 at Vicksburg. And it, you can see the hint because the ship at the bottom that it's firing on is one of David Farragut's seagoing ships that helped capture New Orleans. And the ship above it is um, one of the city class ironclads that came from upriver. And so it's kind of hinting at the dynamic of both US fleets are kind of being defeated and challenged by this one Confederate ship to prove an idea. I see. All right. Well, that's it for me. Uh, questions wise, it looks like, let me just, we got one comment that came here at the end. Uh, John McFarland down in Florida uh, says, thank you. Interesting project uh, <clears throat> presentation. And I want to say thanks again for, for staying up late on the East coast to watch and Neil, you're right in the middle. So not too late, but probably a little after dinner. And when I'm done with this, it's still pretty early here. So I'm going to go get my dinner, enjoy the rest of my evening. Uh, so, yeah, you guys go check out the site, pick up the book if this naval operations is, is, is of interest. Um, and there's so much more to learn. And uh, what else? What are you, what are you working on next? Uh, I'm just, I, there's always 50 things that I'm working on. But <laughs> my, my biggest next, my next big project is looking at um, the Panama route in the Civil War, which is the transportation network like the Pacific Mail mm -hmm. Steamship Company that's transporting gold from California to Panama to New York to finance the U.S. war effort and efforts by the Confederate naval forces to interdict that, as well as Confederate military ground forces to interdict the mines themselves in the southwestern region of the U.S. So um, it's more of the economy, but also lots of interesting small battles and crazy naval intelligence and all of that. So it, yeah. It'd be pretty good. I just got to finish doing something with it and make it happen. But yeah. Yeah. Where well, you're staying in the obscure corners of the civil war. I love it. That's awesome. So, all right guys. Well, thanks everybody for watching. Thanks again, Neil. And uh, we'll catch you all next time. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here.